University with Chevron and a uh, corporate representative uh, board member on the National Office for the World Affairs Council. I'm particularly pleased to be able to introduce this panel this morning because at Chevron we certainly agree that there is indeed a critical linkage between energy security and the environment. Access to reliable, affordable, responsibly produced energy is and will continue to be a strategic element for our nation's security. Our panelists this morning are particularly well versed in these issues, but at the same time they each bring a unique, diverse perspective on what we need to be doing on energy to impact our national economy and national security. Steve Clemens has agreed to moderate the panel. Steve is the founder of the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. And through his widely read blog, The Washington Note, Steve is also providing a regular platform to help infuse the policy debates that go on in this town with some pra pragmatic realism. Our panelists this morning you have their bios in the program, except for uh, Denny McGinn, so I'll give him a little bit more time. Um, retired Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn serves as the director on the board of the National Conference of, on Citizenship. He is currently serving as a military uh, advisor on the board of CNA. But he'll be talking to us this morning in part from his perspective as a senior policy advisor as well with the American Council on Renewable Energy. He also serves as an international security fellow at the Rocky Mountain Institute. So a lot of different perspectives that he brings to the table. Also joining us is Christine Parthamore, who is a senior fellow at CNAS, the Center for New American Security where she directs the National Security Program as well as the national the co-author of a book, A Strong and National Security. So again, Karen Harbert and CEO of the Institute for 20... The Institute is organized to help formulate a common sense energy strategy for our country. Karen travels widely, both here in the U.S. and internationally, to help to raise awareness and and inform those policy debates on how we can take meaningful, realistic actions at local, state, national, and international le levels. And then Bob Kaplan, another CNAS fellow joining us this morning, a noted author and journalist. Bob is also national correspondent for The Atlantic, where his beat covers the globe and he's regularly turned to for his very insightful, thoughtful perspectives. Um, you will also find his latest book out on the table out there, Monsoon, The Indian Ocean and Future of American Power. So I encourage you to check that out um, during breaks. And with that, I turn it over to you, Steve. Great, Thank you very much. Um, Hopefully folks can hear me. I am uh, Steve Clemens. It's great to be with you today, and I'm so pleased that Chevron uh, is, is helping to support the activities of the World Affairs Council in general. I, I remember when I lived in California and Chevron was based in San Francisco, they were supportive of the World Affairs Council throughout the state. I, I don't know who's here from L.A. or Irvine or San Diego or San Francisco, but I used to live in your organizations and basically attend uh, as many functions as I could through the state, and I think that the role of World Affairs Council across the country, I know I'm here to, today in part because of Sky Forster, uh, he, he's off in Colorado now, but, but was running the uh, Pittsburgh uh, World Affairs Council, uh, and, and we've been close friends, and I've, I've traveled to many others, so it's a great, great pleasure. And it's, we've got a cool panel, and we've got about an hour to have a discussion on one of the most important portfolios that any nation, not just the United States, would be considering, energy, security, and the environment, 
are those topics which make or break nations as you look ahead 20, 30, 40 years out, this is not a soft panel. These are tough questions. President Obama today is off to India, then Indonesia, South Korea, and Japan. And I have to tell you that a big chunk of the discussion points and talking points, the strat uh, strategy that will be uh, discussed with other global leaders will deal specifically with these que questions of energy security and the environment. We're going to ask Admiral McGinn to uh, help set in the next eight to ten minutes a quick overview. Uh, I'm a ruthless moderator. If you go over, I'm going to get the hook. Uh, and, and we'll do that. We'll have a discussion. I hope we can have a very active uh, discussion and exchange here. I know we're being uh, recorded live on C-SPAN as well, and we want to make sure we give uh, those many millions of viewers right now a very good show. So, Admiral McGinn. Great. Thank you, Steve. It's uh, great to be with you, and thank you to uh, Chevron as well. I know a little bit about Chevron having commanded the United States ship Wichita, uh, a fleet oiler, home ported out in Oakland, uh, California, when we still had some naval presence in the Bay Area. And uh, we uh, used to go up to Point Melati, uh, right near uh, the uh, Chevron facility, to take on 7 million gallons of uh, liquid cargo. About 60% uh, of it was uh, what we call boiler fuel or DFM, marine diesel, and the other was uh, jet fuel. So uh, I know a little bit about uh, that aspect of, uh, of our energy portfolio. I've been a member of the CNA Military Advisory Board for about uh, three years now. We consist of about uh, 15 retired three and four star officers from all services, including the Coast Guard and National Guard. Uh, the C CNA Military Advisory Board first came together in 2006 to take a look at this thing called climate change. And in 2007, in April, put out a report entitled Climate Change and the Threat to National Security. It was groundbreaking in that what are a bunch of uh, retired uh, flag officers and general officers doing talking about uh, climate change? Isn't that something that uh, tree huggers and big business are supposed to be fighting about? You know, what, what's the national security aspect of it? But the report was groundbreaking in its conclusions based on uh, 15 months of uh, intense uh, analysis talking to experts from across the world, especially from the United States. The conclusion was that the effects of climate change will act as a threat multiplier for instability in critical regions of the world. Now, when uh, the Military Advisory Board first got started, our chairman, uh, retired Army Chief of Staff Gordon Sullivan, said, look, I know there's a lot of uh, controversy out there about climate change. We're a bunch of military guys, and we don't want to come across like we're climate scientists. But he said, let's take this approach. If you wait for 100% certainty on the battlefield, something bad is going to happen. And we never have 100% certainty. So let's take the view, and I would recommend it to this, uh, this uh, group in this organization, that there are risks out there. That climate change is not a political issue. It is a natural phenomenon issue. And that we need to take prudent steps to prevent, mitigate, and adapt to the effects of climate change. Prudent steps. Steps that don't hobble us as a nation economically. Steps that don't impact our quality of life for our presently and going into the future. In many ways, when I hear some of the climate denial or climate skepticism, I'm reminded of uh, my own position regarding my home's fire insurance. I don't have fire insurance because I think my home is going to burn down. I have it because I can't be sure that it won't burn down. Now, if I had a visit from my insurance agent and he said, Admiral, got some bad news for you. Your insurance uh, policy for your fire insurance is going to go up to 10000 a month next month. I guarantee you I'd find a way to not believe in fire anymore. <laughs> I think the psychology and the reason that we are so charged in this nation, in this nation fairly uniquely as opposed to other places around the world, about this thing called climate change, is we've somehow made a connection psychologically that if we believe in climate change and we have to do something about it, it's going to ruin our economy and it's going to ruin our quality of life. 
nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I think if we go about it in the right way and use this challenge of climate change in the right way, we can actually increase our economic strength and increase our quality of life, not just in the United States, but around the world. The other conclusion from this 2007 report was that climate change, energy, and national security are inextricably linked. The topic, if you will, of this forum. So we took a look at the energy posture and put out a report from the Military Advisory Board in 2009, May of 2009. And the conclusion of that report was fairly stark. It said, America's energy posture is a serious and urgent threat to our national security, militarily, economically, and diplomatically. And further, that this vulnerability, primarily driven by our overdependence on fossil fuel, could be exploited by those who would wish to do the United States harm. So the conclusion was business as usual in terms of energy for America is not a viable option. We can't drill baby drill our way out of it as a nation that uses 25% of the oil consumed every year and uses, sits on about 3% uh, of the known reserves. We can get more of those assets, but it isn't sustainable over a long time. And in the energy business, you have to think long time. During the course of our deliberations as we put together our report on energy, one of my colleagues from the uh, military advisory board said, you know, I'm starting to get the idea that there isn't a silver bullet to solve our energy challenges and our climate challenges. And I said, no, there isn't, but there's some silver buckshot. And what we need to do as a nation is we need to take a look at each element of that silver buckshot and create an energy portfolio that is driven by objective analysis and real data and take a look at the costs the benefits and the risks of each form of, of energy and create a government policy that gives some certainty that, to the market so that investors and entrepreneurs and large existing companies know where to put their money and let the market decide as we move into a broader portfolio that is less vulnerable to single point failures. Because think about this. Gas uh, or oil, cost of oil on the world market uh, exceed, I think went above 84 bucks a barrel. Remember back 2008, from $40 to $147 in one year. We spent $386 billion out of our economy in 2008, over a billion dollars a day last year and this year. That is not sustainable. If we are worried about our deficit, if we're worried about our trade imbalance, we cannot continue business as usual. So what we need to do is look for ways that we can create an energy portfolio that doesn't exacerbate the effects of climate change, aggravate them, accelerate them, magnify them, and to do it in a way that enhances our economic, diplomatic, and military components of national security. I look forward to your questions and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral. <clears throat> now, just, just to remind, Karen Herbert Harbert is president and CEO of the Institute for 21st Century Energy. And just to make this some fun, uh, one of my uh, friends, Bjorn Lomborg, has become a big believer uh, that in, in, in the need to move on climate change. But we're 10 years into the new century, uh, and it might, you know, and your report was in 2007. A lot of the folks, including myself, who've been uh, arguing that climate change was going to be a defining challenge for many countries, uh, think that we're, we're very, very late into this game. And so um, I'd love, Karen, in your comments, thinking about energy policy, to look about what, what the costs of moving late in, your, in, in the 21st century are. Karen? Well, thank you. I think, uh, you know, I'm no longer in the energy business. I'm in the reality business. And so I think there's a lot of reality that we need to get on the table here about uh, what we are actually talking about, what the nature of the challenges are. Because energy is no longer an energy issue. It's an economic security issue. It's a national security issue. It's an environmental issue. It's a competitiveness issue. And I think that's really important to understand because 
energy policy, the, or the way that we fashion our energy policy, our regulation, if done right, we will have the affordable, reliable, and increasingly clean energy uh, to power our economy in a very competitive world. Done poorly, we won't, and we will be a second tier nation because our nation is dependent and our economy is dependent on that energy. And so we have to make a distinction that we don't have the luxury of trying, this is not an experiment. This isn't 30 years ago. We live in a very different world at the moment. I want to talk a little bit about that. But we have to deal with the hand we've been dealt, not the hand we'd like to have. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about the hand that we have. And are we fashioning our policy response in response to the hand we have or the hand we'd like to have? I think what we are seeing is that we are dealing with a policy response about a hand that we really don't have. What is the global energy reality? I mean, the energy demand around the world is going to go up by 50% between now and 2035. And most of that uh, is no longer in the developed world, it's in the developing world. So the market is dramatically changed. We are no longer the market maker. Demand for electricity around the world is going to go up by 100% over the same time period. And a billion and a half people don't have access to electricity and everybody's trying to close that energy poverty gap and it's going to take a lot of money to get the energy sources we need into the marketplace. At least $26 trillion according to the International Energy Agency. I think the question for us is do we have the policy and regulatory environment here to attract any of that money and actually to meet our energy demand? I argue that right now, increasingly we're seeing, the answer is no. But what does the energy market look like going forward? If you, if you take the, energy, the International Energy Agency's forecast, you know, in 2030, the global energy marketplace doesn't look that much different. Fossil fuels are here to stay, and that's something we need to understand, accept, <laughs> and manage and decide how we are managing that here at home and are we becoming more self-reliant or not. If we wring our hands about the amount of money we are sending overseas and we know that we are 94% dependent on oil for our transportation sector and that's not going to magically change overnight, are we investing in the resources, are we able to invest in our resources here at home to bring those resources to market? No, we're not. Uh, and then we look at sort of the other inconvenient truth of how the market is changing and where the demand is coming from. And we see that 70% of the world's energy demand is going to be not in the developing world, in the I mean in the developing world, not in the developed world. China is going to surpass the United States as the largest consumer of energy. But interestingly, uh, the Middle East is the second fastest growing region for energy. And obviously they are home uh, and resident to a lot of fossil fuels upon which the world depends. And they are looking now increasingly to satisfy their own internal market first. And then they're looking to their next consumer, their next customer. That is not us, that is Asia. And you are seeing the entire supply chain in the fossil fuel area actually starting to reorient to new markets and next markets. And that's not this market. And I think we have to be cognizant of what that means for our policy framework. And then we have to look at where the resources are and how many more fossil fuels we're going to need. I'm going to talk about renewables in just a sec, but you look at the existing oil fields we know today and they're going into decline. And the new oil is in geopolitically difficult places, geologically difficult places, places that are hostile to foreign investment. And we need to find six times the capacity of Saudi Arabia between now and 2030 to meet the demand for oil uh, as we know it. So we've got a big daunting challenge out there and are we up to it? I think that's the big question for our policymakers. You know, we saw a big election on Tuesday. That didn't change our energy reality. It didn't say, oh, now we're going to deal with this set of books. This is our energy reality. Now it's, it's the same. And quite frankly, I mean, the response, Republican or Democratic, is the same. And it is the silver buckshot, if you will, approach. Um, it is that we need to realize that we are going to have to become more self-reliant. What are we doing right now? Are we actually bringing more oil and gas reserves uh, into the marketplace here at home? In the wake of the tragic BP spill, we have a new regulatory environment, we have a moratorium uh, on our Atlantic coast, on our Pacific coast, a new regulatory regime in the Gulf of Mexico, we've taken off large portions of Alaska, we have canceled leases in Wyoming, Utah, and a lot of other, in Colorado. So are we bringing those resources that have been off limits in our country for, for the better part of 30 years? No. Do we need more electricity in this country? Yes. So what are we doing in that area? Are we bringing more nuclear power uh, into our country? China has on the books 100 plants that they are planning. 
40 of which are under some element of procurement or construction. We have 26 applications in front of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and they haven't made it through the regulatory process. And it is getting more and more expensive and more and more competitive to find those parts around the world because we no longer make them here. And so we don't have new nuclear coming onto the picture. Renewables. You know, everybody would like to see more wind and solar. They currently comprise only 1.3% of our electricity. But you can't get renewable projects built in this country because we have a, a policy response that goes on and off like a light switch. Nobody wants to build anything anywhere. We have a banana syndrome. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. And that is, I mean, it is equally discriminatory against every sort of source of energy. It's not just, you know, dirty, nasty this. I mean, it's not coal or just natural gas or petroleum or pipelines. You know, we don't want wind off the coast of Nantucket. We don't want solar power in the Mojave Desert. We don't want to build transmission lines to move these electrons to market. We don't want to build anything. And I can tell you that's not happening in China. They're building a coal plant every week. They're building a nuclear plant every quarter. They're building transmission lines to move large amounts of electricity from where they are to where they need to be. And yet we're not. We have 400 energy projects today that have been stalled through litigation. That is about 250,000 jobs that were not created and a ton of investment in a time where our economy is desperately in need of investment. And then we have to think about what are we going to do to get beyond that? Do we have the political gumption to say, you know what, we're going to have to get some things built in this country? And right now, our policy response has been to talk more about taking options off the table. Uh, the piece of legislation that passed the House of Representatives uh, well over a year ago for climate change uh, didn't deal with any of these issues. It didn't say, we're going to have more nuclear. In fact, the nuclear title was absent from that piece of legislation. It did nothing to actually get more transmission cited in this country. So we have to have a much more thoughtful adult conversation that we are going to have to have a much more comprehensive approach that breaks down the silos that have in, in, in completely stopped energy policy in this country. We have 13 federal agencies, I used to work for one of them, that's involved in energy policy, and we have 26 congressional committees. So everybody looks at it like this, which is why we don't have a policy that needs to look like this. And so one, one, uh, you know, one agency demonizes another set of issues for another agency, and so we have this very bifurcated, uh, unintelligible energy policy. And that, I think, the fundamental thing that that means for us in the economic position in which we find ourselves in an increasingly competitive economy is that's going to kill us. And we are we're shooting, to use a, a Texas terminology, we're, you know, we're shooting ourselves in the foot and reloading and shooting again. And we are unwilling to use the toolbox that we already have, the resources we have here, both conventional and renewable. We're not willing to build things, to move these things around our country to generate jobs and investment. And we're not willing to compete internationally for the resources we need. So I think it should be a big wake up call that this is a time to start. We don't have the luxury again of, of the next 30 years. We've got to make some decisions now. We need that investment. We need those resources. We need the jobs. But most importantly, we need that affordable and reliable and increasingly cleaner energy to power our competitiveness for the 21st century. Thank you. I'm sure we'll be back to you. Um, Christine uh, Parthamore, before Christine speaks, I've made sort of a hobby now of going back in, to look at Bob Woodward's books and to look at who, which research assistants he really lavished praise on. Uh, uh, and, 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 and you will see Bob Woodward taking the very best of his research assistants and, and saying that you actually do much more than walk on water. And Christine is one of these. Uh, very tough job working for Bob Woodward as she did uh, on, on uh, the book State of the Denial Bush at War. But, but more importantly, she's also a blogger, uh, which I am as well. And so uh, welcome to the stage. I don't think you're blogging yet. We'll work on that. Uh, I don't know if the Institute for what, 21st Century... What about yeah. What yeah. is that? <laughs> I'll tweet just in a moment that you said that. Anyway, Christine, yeah. the floor is yours. And we tweet as well. Social media is wonderful. Um, there's a little different aspect that I'm going to focus on, teeing off of what Admiral McGinn was discussing. And what's interesting is how the Obama administration is looking at these issues and putting them into action. Uh, one of the early examples was that the Department of Defense teed off the great work that CNA did in looking at energy and climate change change and more so bridging the relationship between energy and climate change and national security. One of the things that uh, the, they instructed in their Quadrennial Defense Review, a strategy document that the Department of Defense produces every four years, 
was that they not only discussed that energy and climate change were threats, that they affected security, but they actually did a thorough job in talking to the different combatant commands and talking to regional partners around the world about what to do about this. Uh, one of its findings was that international cooperation was going to be key in getting this right. Uh, as the previous speakers have talked about, um, and what we focus on a lot, is that there are very distinct trade-offs to be made. There are trade-offs between the different uh, energy sources um, and their relationship with other natural resources. For example, nuclear energy, very water intensive. There are proliferation and fissile material control issues uh, to deal with with nuclear power. None of these uh, solutions are going to be simple. Uh, with things like biofuels, you have to take account for food production, for land use change, for deforestation. Every country around the world, including our own, but including many of our key international partners, are going to have to be making these tough trade-off choices on policy decisions for energy and environment over the coming decades. Uh, we foresee not just the direct effects of climate change uh, and how they drive new migration um, and changing energy sources and how that affects geopolitics, having to deal with Venezuela and some other uh, producer countries that are not so friendly to U.S. interests all the time. Those are difficult enough in and of themselves. Um, but if we're not careful about how we conduct international engagement on in these areas, we could wind up uh, in worse places than we already are um, and affecting other issues in negative, with ne negative repercussions that we don't expect. Um, I would point to the recent tensions between Japan and China on rare earth minerals as something that has been bubbling up for years now, um, but no one quite expected it to manifest in as severe of a foreign policy problem as it's become. Uh, our administration, our government, and surely the Japanese and Chinese governments are now having to deal with tension over mineral resources. Um, the same might be said of lithium, with lithium supplies being concentrated in only a few countries. As clean energy technologies drive new manufacturing markets, you have to pay attention to the broad natural resource uh, input implications for those. And what are those going to do to drive new markets, drive importance of new countries, drive reliance on sometimes concentrated supplies of minerals? Um, given the president's current trip in Asia, I'd point to Indonesia as a great example of this. Um, so Indonesia has uh, some of the greatest uh, tropical rainforests left in the world. They're a critical player in climate change negotiations. Um, they're kind of a neutral player. Uh, and sort of smoothing out some of the relationships between developed and developing countries, but they themselves are between a rock and a hard place. As the United States is trying to develop uh, Indonesia as a new strategic partner in the region, uh, we're looking at climate and energy as distinct you know, the Secretary of Defense and uh, Kirk Campbell, our Assistant Secretary for the region, have marked out energy and climate and resources as distinct areas of cooperation with Indonesia as we develop a strategic partnership with them. But they face nothing but hard choices that we need to be cognizant of in our international relations with them. So for example, they have you know, their tropical rainforests that they need to protect. They're, uh, they're standing to be recipients of millions of dollars in funding for reforestation and for protecting their current, uh, their current forest um, their current forest lands. Uh, yet they're trying to develop their mineral resources as well that often uh, is placed in the same area, in the same land area. They also want to, uh, with growing food demand in the region um, and envi growing environmental uh, issues pending in China that they're more concerned about, they're interested in becoming an exporter both of food and biofuels. So you have different, you have mining, fuel, energy, um, climate change and forestation, uh, and biofuels production, all concentrated on a chain of islands. This is going to involve uh, for Indonesian government a very tough range of policy choices on the trade-offs they face and how best to use their land, how best to develop their economy, and how best to manage their resources. You see this everywhere. Uh, Pakistan, for example, China's building two new nuclear reactors there. Pakistan's the most water scarce country in its region, and its water supplies are dwindling as its population grows. So investing in nuclear energy there, which is incredibly water intensive with the style of reactors that they're looking at, might not be the best choice um, for a water scarce country. So um, I'll hand it over to Bob here, but just, just as climate and energy is interlinked, as Admiral McGinn discussed, uh, I would promote everyone who's looking at this area to consider the broad range of environmental and energy and security trade-offs involved with all of these policy decisions.
Thanks. I can't, I, thank you very much, Christina. I can't think of a better person than Robert Kaplan, uh, who, while now a, fiend, a fellow at Center for New American Security, used to be a fellow at the New America Foundation. But it, it, what, what makes Bob Kaplan so cool, despite his ability to write uh, about everywhere he goes, is that I don't know anyone who has a more granular, granular understanding of everything global. Uh, those should be in conflict with each other. But, but Bob is one of the few people in this country, uh, and really in the world, who's able to give a granularity and such a seriousness to the issues uh, that have such enormous consequence. So, Bob Kaplan. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, let me give uh, a geographical perspective on what all the speakers have discussed to kind of reduce this to geography and particularly Eurasian geography. Karen had said that, China, that world global energy demand is going to go up by, what is it, 50% in the mid-2030s? Well, half of that demand is going to come from India and China. Um, and China, you know, the United States has a missionary foreign policy. Whether under Democrats or Republicans, we seek to bring liberal democracy around the world. The Soviet Union had a, had a missionary uh, foreign policy. It sought to promote communism around the world. The Chinese are not burdened by ideas. Their foreign policy is driven by the need to acquire hydrocarbons oil, natural gas, as well as strategic minerals and strategic metals in order to lift the standard of living dramatically of a fifth of humanity, to bring hundreds of millions of Chinese into the middle class, enormous stores of these natural resources are necessary. That's why what China is doing is, fight, is fighting on all fronts. It's building oil and natural gas pipelines from the Caspian Sea across Turkey Turkmenistan, through Uzbekistan, into Western China, across Kazakhstan, into Western China. Um, it's building a deep water port at Kayufru in Burma, where off major natural gas fields with, with the construction of a pipeline across Burma directly into Western China. Um, China, is, China is prospecting for copper in war-torn Afghanistan. Um, if the United States stabilizes or partially stabilizes Afghanistan and brings better government to Pakistan, China will be the beneficiary because it will enable China to completely build this road and pipeline network throughout Central Asia and the greater Middle East, bringing energy stores directly into Western China, that if you look at a map of this emerging nexus of roads and pipelines, it can, is equivalent to the Chinese map during the 8th century Tang Dynasty, um, when China extended and its influence extended all the way to Khorasan in northeastern Iran. Um, on the subject of Iran, there is a Chinese-Iranian access developing, develop, um, um, predicated on energy. Uh, China needs Ir Iran's huge stores of natural gas um, that are th that is less polluting. That China can either bring overland or through, or through Persian Gulf ports, ship across the Indian Ocean through the Strait of Malacca. In China's quest for energy, it faces what Hu Jintao is reportedly called a Malacca dilemma. Uh, too much of China's energy is coming, has to uh, negotiate its way through the narrow, shoal-ridden, precarious Strait of Malacca on oil, major oil tankers coming across the Indian Ocean. That's why, uh, that's why the Chinese want to diversify. It's why they're building pipelines in Central Asia. It's why they want a direct pipeline link from the Bay of Bengal across Burma. And one day, decades hence, the Chinese have just built a big port in Gwadar, Pakistan, um, you know, you know, to perhaps in the future to bring energy from the Middle East across uh, uh, all through Pakistan into western China. In other words, the real energy nexus of the world is between uh, the hydrocarbons of the Arabian Peninsula and the Iranian Plateau and the burgeoning middle class flesh pots of East Asia. China, South Korea, Japan. Um, India also will be a major um, a major gobbler up 
of energy. It is increase, buying increasing amounts of coal from Mozambique in southern Africa, which it is shipping by, uh, um, by, um, by, by tanker ships um, to India. Um, India is also building a port um, in off Burma's coast in Sitwe, uh, near these natural gas fields, where China's pipelines want to go E northeast across Burma, India's, India's pipelines want to go west through Bangladesh into India. India and China are fighting over Burma. Think of Burma as a, the Belgium before World War I. Squeeze between France and Germany. Think of it squeeze between India and China. Burma is not only the, one of the most benighted authoritarian military regimes in the world, it is also incredibly rich in natural gas, in timber, in hydropower, in uranium, in gold. It's an energy storehouse. And so as China um, turns Burma into a veritable satellite through the building of roads and rail links precisely to get energy and other natural resources, democratic pro-Western India cannot stand aside. It cannot, uh, it cannot issue moralistic pronouncements from the sidelines half a world away about the need for democracy in Burma. It has to engage Burma. So India has extensive military links with the Burmese security forces, extensive political links, etc. A lot of this is driven by energy. Um, what we're going to see in the 21st century is a global energy interstate uh, around the whole navigable southern Eurasian rimland, extending from the Middle East and the Horn of Africa all the way through the Strait of Malacca and up north through the Western Pacific to, 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 the, to, the, to coastal China, South Korea, and Japan. And where energy goes, military activity will go. Because world navies are navies will, for one reason is to protect the sea lines of communication and to keep them open. Globalization happens because we have, uh, we have relatively safe sea lines of communication with piracy as, as a nuisance that makes an in interesting story for the media, but is not yet reached, at least not yet, reached strategic proportions. Um, and, um, so in this future, we're going to see the growth of navies in India, China, uh, with the relative distance between those in the U.S. Navy star slowly starting to close in order to protect these energy routes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Oh, terrific. Let me just pose a question before I open uh, up to the floor, and I guess we've got microphones uh, here for people to move to. Uh, as, as you see fit, we'll, we'll move that way. But let me just say, you know, my, my sense is that, that in the, the, the latter half of the 20th century, up until a few years ago, the United States was essentially the hegemon when it came to oil and energy movement all around the world. Yes, uh, you had the Saudis. Yes, you had other energy players. But, but the bottom line was we called the shots. And when you are calling the shots globally, you can actually actually get away without having a strategy. Because then essentially everyone depends upon you. Reserve currencies, etc., are all part of you basically being king of the hill. I don't get the sense today. When I listen to Bob Kaplan, and I also listen to you, Karen, I hear two things. China has a strategy. If you look at the largest uh, companies in the world today, they're all oil and energy companies, and they're all national, national companies. Uh, you know, with all due respect to Chevron and Exxon, etc., the largest firms in the world are in Russia, or in Saudi Arabia, or in others, and these are uh, really the newest features of a state capitalism that has taken over. What's behind state capitalism? State strategies, energy strategies, hydrocarbon strategies. And it does, and I come back to your point, Karen, where you said we don't have a strategy. And I'm wondering whether the character and composition of the way we have these discussions is, needs to change, that the uh, DNA of our companies and players in this needs to change, that we have an inability actually to address what's happening with China and Russia and other players uh, because we basically are still in the mold where we think we're the hegemonic player in this area and we're not. So I'd love to get any responses from folks and then I'd, I'd um, appreciate opening to the floor. Yes, Danny? My definition of strategy is it's the art and science of allocating scarce and valuable resources. 
And in the case of uh, the United States, uh, we have not done that as wisely because we, are, we have not valued energy to the way that we must do going forward in the future. China's case, I want to go back to the early 1990s when the Cold War had ended, the wall came down. The countries of the former Warsaw Pact wanted to have a world-class telecommunications uh, capability. Now they could have gone out and done it the way we did in Western Europe and in the United States and <coughs> cut down a bunch of trees and created um, telephone poles and, and uh, they could have uh, gotten uh, futures on, on copper and strung wire, but they didn't. Why? Because they didn't have to. They didn't have to because of wireless. And they have a, t a world class telecommunications capability with all the benefits to their economies and quality of life. My point is this as we look not just at the United States, but nations like China and India, we've got to recognize that they don't have to achieve this quality of life and economic vitality the same way that we did. In fact, they can't. It is not sustainable for them to do it that way. Therefore, it creates a tremendous opportunity for us diplomatically, militarily, and economically to engage with these countries to bring the best of innovation, the best of technology from the United States to show them what we can do with energy efficiency, what we can do with clean energy, what we can do using the scarce and valuable resources that our fossil fuel reserves represent across the board going after this silver buckshot approach and do it in a way that really enhances the leadership value of the United States uh, for ourselves as well as for other nations in the world. We don't, if we think we're going to do it in the 21st century the way we did in the 20th century, we are headed for an unsustainable and pretty ugly world. I'm going to encourage briefer responses, but just a quick retort to my friend Admiral McGlynn. When Barack Obama, well, he won't do this, but if he gets on a metro and goes through all those crowded hills in, in Seoul, South Korea, and he pulls out the Blackberry he likes to use, he will find an unbelievable infrastructure there that he doesn't even have walking around in the streets of New York City. So we need to be careful with hubris on this side of what we think we have and can do, because another picture of this is how miserably we've invested in our infrastructure in this country while China is just pouring it in. So I just, just put that in there. Um, Karen and, and Bob and Christina? We, the, the market upon which we relied for so long uh, has masked the fact that we don't have an energy policy because it was out there in the global marketplace and we were able to manage that through supply and demand. But it's much different as the, the supply centers have, you know, start looking to new demand centers. And so if you, you look at coal, for example, I mean, we, we don't really have for any intents and purposes any new coal fire generation being built in this country. And you look at the coal, you know, you talk to the coal companies and they say, you know what, if, if we're going to decide through regulation that we don't want to build any new coal plants here, that doesn't stop the production of coal. It just changes who I'm going to sell it to. Because I could sell every day all of my production to China and India uh, and several other countries that need coal. And we have pretty good quality coal here in comparison to what China has. So if we don't want to hear, I'm still going to sell it and it's still going to get burned and it's still going to be an issue for climate change, but it's going to be burned in countries that don't have environmental regulation like we do. So we have to start thinking about, you know, what are we looking at in terms of our, our resource capacity here? And are we developing the technologies to use them in an increasing clean manner? I would suggest that we don't want to export all of our technologies because we did that in nuclear and now we don't really produce anything here anymore. Uh, and we certainly saw what happened in the renewable side of things and now we don't produce any of that here anymore. Uh, we have to be careful that we actually see this much more strategically and to use the resources, the technologies, and the innovation, which is the foundation of our competitiveness, much more to our advantage. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, um, where this is going to come to a geographical head between America without a strategy and China with a strategy is in the Gulf of Guinea in Africa. Um, because, the, because the Chinese have a thought out uh, strategy that combines state-owned companies and government uh, 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 and workers uh, you know, to, you know, 
to, to get the hydrocarbons from the western coast of Africa, particularly the Gulf of Guinea, to mine for iron ore and, and, and cobalt in the Congo and all, building railway lines and everything. We've had a haphazard approach. Our companies are not in line with the government, and, we, and, and we're having problems with Africa Command, AfricaCom as it is known. We can't get, you know, we can't get enough State Department into the mix with the military. It's, um, look, you know, look at how dynamic the Chinese are in Africa and, and how less so we have been. Yeah, I would just add that, I would add that your example is even more pervasive than just energy, and Bob discussed this a little bit. The Chinese uh, planned and have been working since the 80s to develop their rare earth minerals sector because they understood the role of their raw materials and the resources in manufacturing and their broader economic trends that they were trying to push. They're doing the same thing now with fertilizer, uh, trying to invest in Canadian companies because they understand the coming pressures on their food system. They foresee it and they're planning for it. It's a very, very stark contrast. Um, but we're seeing what we're seeing because of very deliberate planning. We can replicate that. Um, a little tidbit for contrast, on rare earth minerals in our own country, Congress about a year ago uh, required the Department of Defense to look at how we would use rare earth minerals in all of our weapon systems. It took them uh, many months to compile this because we didn't know. So not only do we not have a grander strategy, looking at all these issues in a holistic manner and figuring out where we need to go, but oftentimes the details that we need to know to do that are buried in the private sector where we don't have good enough relationships to be able to pull that adequate information to solve the problem. It's interesting in the 1990s when I worked for Senator Jeff Bingaman, we were one of the Senate offices that constantly called for an analysis of these strategic dependencies and uh, I think after the last report I was there, the next year, the whole operation was shut down uh, in the government, in the, in the downsizing of government that had happened. So we actually put ourselves out of business. But there used to be that knowledge uh, in the 1990s. Karen? The one thing I think is interesting to talk about, and you've touched on it, is that we're looking at exchanging one dependency for another. If you look at, you know, in the transportation sector, okay, we don't want to use, uh, you know, we, we want to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. Okay, we're going to move to plug-in hybrids. So what does that mean? We're going to now be dependent on Bolivia and Afghanistan for lithium. Uh, you know, for the, for, and are we going to be looking, you know, we look at uranium. And so we, there are trade-offs. We have to look at the trade-offs. And that's why I think this knee-jerk, you know, there are these magic solutions policies. We have to have a much more adult conversation about the unintended consequences a lot of these policies because they're not well understood and not well thought through. Thank you. Uh, Denny, very quickly. Per perhaps without saying, but we need to be very careful to, to avoid this uh, temptation to believe that China has it right strategically and we have it wrong. There's some tremendous downside to the Chinese strategy. Why did they shut down industrial activity for about a month's time, about the time they hosted the Olympics? And all of the disasters you hear about in terms of mineral extraction, of polluted rivers, polluted land, and polluted air, they do not have it right. And in fact, the exploitation in the Gulf of Guinea or in uh, other parts of Africa could really, really cause some tremendous stability problems and security problems. So, To reinforce what the Admiral just said, I lived in China for three months this year. And there were three days of those three months where I didn't wake up, uh, walk outside into a co white cotton candy kind of like gauze that you would breathe and taste. Uh, it was really the most horrible, this is Beijing, most horrible pollution uh, I've experienced. So I, I do think they're clearly down. We'll start here. Yeah. Russell Jones, I'm a member of the uh, DC World Affairs Council. Uh, I have a geographical question from a different part of the world. I just got back from three years living and working in the United Arab Emirates and I haven't heard anybody mention the Strait of Hormuz uh, where the Iranians are threatening to put mines in, where the UAE, Abu Dhabi for example, building a pipeline to Fujairah to get around the Strait and get its oil out, uh, uh, Dubai trying to build a, a, a channel through the mountains so it can sell it to the Saudis to get their oil out. Uh, what are the dynamics of, uh, of that uh, older part of the world? Vulnerability, our over-reliance on fossil fuels is exploitable by those who would wish to do us harm. As we increase the pressure of sanctions on Iran, what is to prevent? Who can guarantee us that we will not see the radical wing of the Iranian Republican Guards close down the Strait of Hormuz through which about 25 or 30 percent of the world's oil flows every single day. 
The United States Navy and our allies will kick their butt, but it won't happen overnight. It would take probably months to clear mines, to make sure the submarine threat was not there, high-speed boats, and all that time, imagine the reverberations throughout the global economy, especially in the United States, being denied 25 to 30 percent of the oil for the lifeblood of the world's economy. Uh, let me just add that uh, Iran has a sh uh, an incredibly complex shattered coastline all along the Persian Gulf. It's twice the length of coastline of the next longest coastline, which is the United Arab Emirates. And in those coves and inlets, you don't have the Iranian Navy. You have the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy, which is a whole different beast in and of itself with lots of small speedboats, training and swarming operations and in this intense global media environment that we live in. Imagine just a nick of a shoulder-fired missile from one of these boats on a, on, on a warship, you know, on a warship of one of these other nations. You know what, you know, you know, that would be a great media story and they could do a lot worse. But what is the right policy response from an energy point of view? Is it that, you know, if, if we're facing, you know, a potential catastrophe in that part of the, air, uh, part of the world, then why aren't we doing more at home to actually expand you know, exploration and production here? We're the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, uh, and we have a lot of, of hydro, we have a lot of oil in this country, and yet we're keeping it off limits for exploration. And so you have to say, we understand this threat, and yet we're willing to do nothing about it. It's very important, in my view, to recognize that the carelessness that often, uh, the recklessness that I think happens when it comes to talking about war and peace in Washington when you think about Iran or something, what may happen, Iran, Russia, China, et cetera, are automatic beneficiaries of any spike in oil prices. Uh, the U.S. system is not. And I'll tell you, when oil was, when, when the price of gas was over $4 a gallon, I have a buddy who works in the Highway uh, Safety um, Administration and said, you know what, Steve? No one's dying on the highways. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, people have stopped driving we see behavior changing. There's no social driving going on in the country. It was one of those inflection points where you saw a change in behavior. Uh, anyone who knows my politics knows that I don't often hang out with Richard Pearl, Jim Woolsey, Charles Krauthammer, not my crowd. We got together and we talked about how could we keep the price or a tax on oil and energy in this country because we saw changes of behavior, not just in the way people were driving, but what would be the opportunities in industry? If you have a very, very subsidized price of oil and gas in the United States, which is part of our strategy, you actually buffer the American public from the costs of questions about what's going on in Iran, and et cetera. So I, th I think it's complex. The key is there's no larger discussion of, of general strategy. Yes, ma'am. Kansas City, and all of you have, talk, have talked about the fact that China has a, a strategy, maybe right, wrong, and the United States doesn't. Um, it's easy to see how China can develop a strategy because they're not a democracy. They just have to get a few people alone in a room and say this is what it is. In the United States, even looking at Tuesday in the election, how do we ever get to agreement? How do we ever get to a strategy, whatever that might be? respond quickly on this. I think that's an oversimplification of China. China has many moving pieces. It's a mistake to think that decision making in China, which I think is in, it, it has been getting a lot right, some wrong, nonetheless has become more and more sophisticated, if not a democracy. Uh, on the United States side, I think the question is not abandoning this. You've, it's the question of how you bring together and whether you believe, as Karen said, are you willing to bring the environmental community, the energy community, the 17 different parts of the energy picture together in a serious discussion about costs and benefits of a variety of, of, of approaches. And I, I would put that to you. I think it's vital. But I can tell you in the Senate, we didn't want to have that. We wanted to talk about fads solar or this or nuclear i mean it could be it could be any one of these it's not that any one of these is the silver bullet in fact there is no silver bullet but yeah 
picking winners and losers repeatedly. Uh, and that has not done our energy picture any good. And so we do need to have that adult conversation. But I, I think it, it, it is one that, that has to recognize, again, going back to what I said at the beginning, we sort of have a fundamental energy reality. We may want it to look different. We may want it to, to look like we can have wind all over the place within the next five years. But the fundamental reality is, is that's not going to happen. And so we have the opportunity to have a comprehensive energy policy. There's a lot of agreement. I mean, the American people, the last poll I saw from the Pew Research Center, 62% of America still is in favor of drilling. There's 72% in favor of nuclear. Everybody's in favor of energy efficiency. People want more. There are elements. But what we have chosen to debate in policy circles is everything where there's not agreement. And unfortunately, that is climate change. We have focused all of the political muscle on addressing climate change without addressing the energy picture. And the climate proposals that we'll put forward that we're going to raise the price of energy were loudly and roundly rejected by the American people because of our economic picture. We need to be focusing on actually putting forward those solutions that will keep energy affordable, not demonstrably change the quality of life, because I don't think people enjoyed $4.50 gas. In fact, I can remember giving a lot of speeches back then when people had to cancel their summer vacations and they were downright mad and their kids don't let them forget it. So I don't think we want to, we want to be able to make this solution cheaper. We need the technologies. We need to invest in R&D. We need all options. But saying that we're only going to have this or only have that, which is what our policy response has been, is just ill-informed. We're going to need it all and we have to recognize that. How many of you have these? You would not have had these if we hadn't had a massive change in the way spectrum was allocated in the United States. There's no uh, more interesting comparison or metaphor that I can think of than that, that world for thinking about what we yet need to do in energy. In the spectrum area in which you had the Department of Defense sitting on way too much of the spectrum. You had incumbent broadcasters that had spectrum given to them that they were poorly using. You had new entrants to the market that couldn't get in. And we had a discussion and debate in this country in which we finally got out of, this, of the fad approach and the winners and losers, but we nonetheless came and brought all the stakeholders together and finally had a serious discussion about changing the game of winners and losers and creating a dynamic that opened up spectrum policy to many more innovators out there and to creating a much more rational approach. This often isn't discussed, but it's a lot like the energy picture, whether you're talking about oil shales, you're talking about uh, uh, not having industrial level projects in renewables or offshore, et cetera. That, that, so I would just put that, at, that it may be a useful meta metaphor to look at. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, Mac Pogue uh, with the World Affairs Council in Peoria, Illinois. And um, uh, my question relates to uh, the issue that you brought up earlier about, you know, the high pollution, uh, especially in these, in these new emerging areas. Um, with our high, high prowess of engineering, you, you, know, cap you know, capability and our intellectual capital here in our country, why aren't we exporting more of our services for, you know, pollution control and, you know, that kind of thing uh, uh, to China and, uh, you know, to help them with their air and water pollution, et cetera, you know. High tariffs, unbelievably, there are high tariffs on clean energy goods and services still. And that is something, whether you believe in the Doha round is going to succeed or is going to fail, if we actually really wanted to do something about energy and the environment globally, we would lead an effort to completely eliminate the high tariffs on clean energy goods and services. It would create jobs here, investment here, exports, reduce our trade deficit to China, but we're not willing to even do that. And that's something that's free. Doesn't add to the deficit, which everybody's concerned about. So there are things we could do immediately to, to address that. Any other, Christine? Uh, I, I would just say very quickly this gentleman that, that, again, I don't want to be the myth buster on China. China is doing everything. Anyone that goes to China and sees you're going to see natural gas plants going up. You're going to see clean oil efforts. You're going to see solar uh, subsidized through the roof. You're going to see uh, wind. China's growing so fast that they're doing everything. And we are, in fact, exporting tons of services. But the scale, China is changing the way global gravity works by its plan to urbanize 300 million more people in 15 years. It's going to be the biggest economic change in human history. Uh, in a very short period of time, and we are there, maybe not at the scale we should be, but don't think they're not doing anything. It's just that everything bad and everything good is happening at the same time. So, yes, Sky Forster. And S Steve, your comment is a great segue to my question because I want to ask the panel, invite the panel to look a little further out. I mean, the, the thrust of all of this is yes, China and India are going to be 
out there getting resources and looking for energy, and that means we're going to bump into them and maybe in some not some nice ways. But further out, ultimately, it seems to me, China and India are becoming more vulnerable to others. And we, even when we were king of the hill and had all the cards, found ourselves uncomfortably vulnerable to some of our own clients. And so I'm wondering about China's long-term vulnerability and India's themselves. They may be large economies, but on a per capita basis, they're still very poor countries. We're going to make this last question. So Bob, and, and any other comments? Bob yeah. Kaplan? And India are becoming more vulnerable to each other. Um, because as, cause as each is, expands its sphere of influence, those spheres of influence overlap. China and India, outside of a border war in 1962, throughout history, never had much to do with each other because of the Himalayas. But now um, you have air bases in Tibet where the arc of operations of Chinese fighter jets includes India. And you have Indian warships in the South China Sea. So there's first that. Secondly, China is starting to make a lot of enemies in places like Africa um, because, uh, you know, because of the way that it does things, the way it's, um, you, you, um, you know, it's, it, it, China has this idea, you build these big mining operations and, and a hydrocarbon extraction facilities and you build railroads and roads to them, but what it hasn't quite figured out is when you do all that, you become invested in that country's politics. Um, you just are. You become vulnerable to those countries' politics and you become, just like Americans became, just like big Burger King Cold War style military bases of the United States and Japan and Germany and Turkey became kind of focal points of local medias in all those countries in a negative way. The same is starting to happen to a lot of Chinese facilities um, in Africa and in other places and you can include uh, a little bit less Central Asia and Burma. Uh, the Burmese regime is, is, is terrified of becoming a satellite of China but doesn't know what to do about it. Um, India less so because India is not at the scale that China is in terms of power. India is still a great regional power more than it is a great power. Bob's comments you can reinforce it. Be careful what you wish for. You have to be really, really uh, strategic in a long range uh, way uh, beyond the next uh, generation to see what the likely unintended consequences are. And that applies certainly to our own posture. Uh, the less vulnerable we could become, uh, the more secure and, and uh, economically prosperous we'll be. Thank you. Christina? Yep, I would just say yeah, with the broadening, I appreciate that. I would project that if we have the same conversation, hopefully better conversation, but if we're still talking about these issues in the same light in five or ten years, that we'll be talking about Amazonia and the Arctic as much as we're talking about China and India. There are regions where these issues are starting to hit on questions of not just territory but sovereignty and what that's going to mean over the next century that have real strong implications for our international relations and for U.S. security in the world. So I would just project that in terms of thinking of the long term. Thank you. At a reordering of the a reordering of the world order, if you will, and we have to decide, you know, what we're going to do to, you know, maintain us as a first tier part of that, and energy really comes uh, right to the forefront of that, and we have to decide to become more self reliant and do the right hard choices at home, because the the the, the landscape, the battlefield, is so much more complicated that we actually don't know who's the enemy anymore. Right now, I would say the enemy is us.